Hello and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, your source for travel stories, travel destinations, and travel philosophy. I'm Amanda. I'm Ryan. And we're your hosts. Hey everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the World Wanders podcast. We are so excited that you've decided to join us today. And today on the podcast, we are talking with Riley Tench. Yeah, Riley is in a fascinating position and has a fascinating story. And that is because he is currently on a cruise ship in Asia and has been there for over a hundred days. So when we recorded this, he was at 116 days and we first encountered Riley on YouTube. We're like, his videos are so interesting. This is such an interesting experience. We want to have him on the podcast. We want to find out what it's been like um, to have been on a, stuck on a cruise ship for that long. And so we're really excited to chat with him. Uh, and if you want to check out more of Riley's work. Um, you'll hear about it in the interview, but you can go to YouTube and find him at Riley Tench or on Instagram as well. He's got lots of incredible videos about his time uh, on the cruise ship. And so before we get into the episode, we just want to take a second to remind you guys that on the World Wanderers Insider podcast, we are doing exclusive interviews talking about digital nomad stuff. So how to make money working online and not in any type of like cheesy or corny or um, way like that, but just simply talking to people who are living and working as nomads, um, may not be traveling right now, but people who have been able to create careers that allow them to work wherever they want and really breaking down the details of that. So you can find that at patreon.com slash the world wanderers to get access to the insider podcast. Yeah. And over on our World Wonders Insider podcast, you will hear some of your favorite guests from this podcast, Sasha and Rachel from Grateful Gypsies, Nathan from Foodie Flashpacker, and Becky Gillespie from Tokyo Becky, and so many more. So we would love to have you over there. Like Ryan said, it's patreon.com forward slash the world wonders. And without further ado, here is Riley. Welcome to the podcast today, Riley. We're super excited to have you here with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And where are you joining us from today? I am currently pulling out of Manila Bay in the Philippines. Amazing. And I'm sure that there's, you know, lots of good stuff that we can chat about with this whole cruise ship journey that you've been on. But let's back up a little bit. Can you tell us like how you first got into travel and what kind of inspired you towards the life that you're living now? Um. I mean, ever since I was a kid, like my parents were big travelers. We explored a lot of the world, especially the United States from a pretty early age. I grew up in North Carolina, actually. And when I was like 12, we ended up making a cross country trip to move all the way to Alaska. So that was a crazy odyssey by itself. And you know, we've always been kind of adventurers as a family and that definitely carried into my adult life. And, you know, I, the idea, the prospect of cruise ships and working on one from like a really early age in high school always intrigued me. And yeah, here I am, you know, just traveling around the world, getting paid to do it. And well, I mean, I was getting paid, (laughs) (laughs) Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, especially for somebody my age, it's, it's perfect. You know, I get to see so much, like so little cost to myself. Yeah. And so when did you first start, start and get your first job on good cruise ship? So uh, I actually started on a different cruise ship on Anthem of the Seas. Uh, in kind of mid 2018, I'd say. And that was three contracts ago. So Anthem of the Seas goes out of New Jersey and does cruises to Bermuda and parts of the Western Caribbean. And then during the fall, they go to New England and Canada and stuff like that. And it was a really great way to kind of get into cruise ships without like, jumping into a fully foreign experience to me because, you know, I'm from Alaska. So I was still cruising with mostly Americans and stuff, but it got my toes wet to the experience. And then after that first contract ended in December of 2018, 
I was given the opportunity to take another contract on Quantum of the Seas out here in Asia. And so far, I've done two contracts out here. It's been incredible. It like just traveling around. I started in China and Japan and saw a lot of that market, saw a lot of the different ports and unique opportunities and culture exposures that they were up there. And, you know, now we've moved down to Southeast Asia and I've gotten to see Singapore and Thailand and Malaysia and all the unique parts of the world that are down here. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine it must be so cool to be able to, to travel, you know, it's just like day to day to day to be in such different and distinct places. And when it comes yeah, you to wake up in a completely different place every single day, it's, it's funny, a very we, unique lifestyle. We're in Canada right now, but we were actually based in Panama and it was cool because Panama is obviously a big point for a lot of cruise ships crossing um, through the Panama canal. And we had friends who were doing a, a 77 day cruise around South America with their kids. And it's something you don't really think about, like how fast a cruise ship can move. Cause like you see them and you're like, Oh, they move kind of slow. But we, uh, met with our friends we saw them cross the canal. They had a day there with, in port. And so we were able to hang out with them and then, you know, they, their cruise took off and went on its way and we were still in Panama. And then like four days later, they're in like Ecuador. And then the next day it's like Peru. And then they're in Antarctica, like two days later. <laughs> it, was, it was more than that, but it's like, you know, not that much has changed on our end. Cause we're just in our apartment in Panama city. And it's like, you know, 10 days later and we're like, Holy shit. They're at like the tip of South America. Like it's kind of crazy. You, you kind of forget how fast you can get someplace when you're actually moving consistently. Especially when you don't have to follow any roads or anything, you know, you, most of the time you're just kind of either sticking along the coastline or just going in a straight line. And yeah, a lot of these ships nowadays can go surprisingly fast and it still surprises me how quickly we can get from, you know, somewhere like New York City all the way down to the Caribbean in literally like a day and a half. Um, yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's pretty wild. I've only been on one cruise before and Ryan's actually never been on a cruise. And I did uh, the Caribbean islands. I think we went from like, yeah, Puerto Rico to Puerto Rico. It was like a week, but we did pretty much a different Caribbean island every single day. And we did a lot of the traveling at night. So you'd feel the boat leave kind of around dinner time, And then, you know, you could kind of watch the, the ocean go by, which was so cool at night. And then you'd wake up and you're like, in port, you're like at, in a different place. And I just thought that was the most, I was 18 at the time. And I just thought it was the coolest thing that I'd like ever done in my life at that point. Like, oh, I'm in a different country today. Like how neat is that? <laughs> it, it, it's pretty insane. I did something similar in, on like one of my first passenger cruises when my family went to Hawaii and it was like a different Hawaiian Island every single day. And it was a great way to experience Hawaii. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a very unique way to travel and see the world. And so when it comes to day-to-day -day work across those three contracts, what have you been doing and what does it kind of look like day-to-day? -day? Um, so yeah, when we're actually, you know, doing normal operations and stuff, I would be a lighting technician. So, you know, we have a lot, it's a big cruise ship. We have a lot of entertainment options on board. Uh, we have full-on production shows. Some of our ships even have full Broadway productions. And, you know, you need technicians and stage staff and people keeping track of all the stuff behind the scenes and making sure those shows go off without a hitch. So I generally get put in charge of a specific venue on the ship and all of the lighting fixtures and elements of lighting in that room. And then I'll be running the console during the shows and programming new shows and doing maintenance if anything breaks and stuff like that. Oh, awesome. That's such a cool job to have on a cruise ship. I feel like that's the type of thing where, you know, maybe for, maybe for ourselves, but also listeners listening, like might be a totally unexpected job that you could have. And I think sometimes we think of like, jobs on cruise ships is just being the customer facing people like the ones that you might see as a guest on a ship and really i mean they need people for everything that happens in the day-to-day -day operations with the boat so i'm sure there's a lot of really cool jobs that you can get on a cruise ship 
Definitely. You know, there's, um, there's so many opportunities, especially on some of the really big ships. You know, my ship isn't even one of the largest ones in the Royal Caribbean fleet. And although it is very big, you know, we have about 6,400 passengers under max capacity. Um, and that's including the crew. You know, there's, there's other ships in the fleet that are closer to like eight or 9,000. So, you know, when you've got this massive ship that is essentially a self-sustaining city just floating around, moving from port to port, you know, it takes a lot of different types of people from all sorts of different backgrounds to keep that running. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine. And so when it comes to this, you mentioned off the top, like, it being a weird time and going through, I think you, you mentioned like being over a hundred days now kind of in quarantine, but, but when it comes to like, it's kind of interesting because this whole process, I think everyone living through it has kind of been like, you become aware of it. There's like some things going on and it's like building and building and building. And then all of a sudden it's like there impacting your life. But what was it like kind of, I guess it would have been around the turn, like start a new year and then into January where you start hearing about coronavirus. I can't remember the exact dates of when um, all the stuff with Diamond Princess happens, but what was that kind of early stage of coronavirus like working on a cruise ship? Well, you know, it's interesting because we were so much closer to the initial wave that came out of China. It kind of affected us a lot sooner than I think it affected most of the rest of the world. So yeah, you're right. Like in January, we were definitely like reading the news, like there's this new virus in China and it's not looking very good. And it just kept progressively getting worse. And um, it must have been late February that we ended up canceling, I think it was three future sailings just to kind of take a step back for about 14 days and kind of take a look at the situation and hit the pause button because yeah, you were right. Like the diamond princess was this crazy thing that happened. And we didn't want a repeat of that on one of our company ships, especially in the Asian market. So um, that was kind of the company's decision was just, you know, take a step back, hit the pause button, assess the situation. And we were originally only planning to, do that quarantine, that volunteer, voluntary quarantine period for like 14 days or so, but that has ended up getting extended for about 116 days now, 116, 117, and we're still here, so. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's wild, that's so wild. And so I guess 116 days from the current date that we're talking, this would have been back in February. And so what did it kind of look like as they're like, okay, so we're canceling trips, but we need staff still on the cruise ship is like, how did that kind of all go down in terms of like actually stopping picking a port to dock at? Like, were you guys allowed off? Did you have to stay on? Yeah. So, I mean, everything shut down really quickly. So, you know, when we stopped cruising, a lot of the like cities and ports around us were already starting to go into lockdown and start putting restrictions on movement control orders and all that stuff. So it became really difficult for us to move anybody on or off the ship because, you know, cruise ships got a lot of bad press because of what happened on the Diamond Princess and other similar ships. And, you know, it was, it was pretty chaotic for a time. And, you know, there's still kind of this bias that governments are pretty much slapping these regulations on all the different cruise ships and making it, making us have to jump through a lot of hoops to get people off, which is, you know, rightfully so. I mean, the times we live in right now, it's, it's totally understandable that they want to do as much as they can to protect their citizens and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it was definitely difficult to, you know, get people on and off the ship. So a lot of people were stuck there for a time. We were still getting paid for a while up until like late March, actually a full month after 
we had stopped cruising. Everybody was still getting paid because we really didn't know when we were going to return to service. So we were just kind of playing the waiting game and watching the numbers. And, you know, I, I don't really know what was going on behind the scenes, but um, eventually they decided that they just couldn't afford to keep so many people on payroll. So um, I had been using the opportunity to catch up on a bunch of maintenance on my lights. And eventually they just decided they had to cut a bunch of those contracts and lose some of those um, positions. So we were still on the ship for a while, but uh, just getting unpaid. But they, they've still been treating us really well, still feeding us and so many freedom, free amenities and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad they're still feeding you guys. <laughs> I'm sure it'd be like a different episode if it was like, oh yeah, we've mutinied, we've taken over the that, ship, it's now it's a like, pirate ship. Blink twice insane. if you need oh a humanitarian God. flight. Blink twice if you need our help. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You're like, God. we're fishing for ourselves. <laughs> we have no fresh water. Yeah, yeah we're working on it. <laughs> and so you guys were, were you guys docked like outside of Manila for like since February or have you guys, has the ship been no, moving around? We, we've been going all over the place. So, you know, it got to the point that pretty much the most economical way to get some of the crew members on the ship home repatriated to their countries was to physically move the ship to that country and physically put the people on one of our lifeboats and take them to the dock at the country and then like just give them their passports and, put them back in their country, you know? <laughs> so um, we did that for China. We went up to Shanghai and dropped off all of our Chinese crew members that wanted to sign off. We, we didn't force anybody to sign off. Anybody that wanted to stay was welcome to stay on the ship if they feared for their safety about the virus or anything like that. So, you know, we signed off the Chinese crew members that wanted to go home. We signed off the Indonesian crew members that wanted to go, go home. We did the same thing here in the Manila for the Philippines and uh, several other places and Indians as well. We didn't go to India, but we put them on another ship that was going to India. So it, there's been a lot of operational logistics going on behind the scenes to shuffle people around between ships and countries to try to get as many people home as possible. And so are you guys heading back to the U.S. next or what's kind of like the future of that look like? Um, so at this point, uh, Manila has actually been the only port in the Asian market right now that's been allowing international crew members to sign off cruise ships. So not just us, but a lot of other cruise ships in this region of the world have been coming to Manila and flying their international crew members home. So most of the Americans and Canadians and so many other countries have gotten to either book charter flights or commercial flights out of Manila back to their home countries. And uh, we actually set up a testing center on the ships so that we can test all of our crew members or at least the ones that are required to be tested for the virus on the ship before they even have to set foot on land. So we can be absolutely sure that there's no risk of, you know, introducing a new infection to the country after they go home. Um, but we're pretty confident there's no virus here on the ship at this point. It's just kind of a precaution. I was going to say 116 days. You guys must have a pretty good idea of <laughs> if somebody's sick or not. <laughs> you would think so. But, you know, the, the powers that be right now are just being so cautious when it comes to all of this. And, yeah, like I said, there's a lot of hoops they're making us jump through, even though we've kind of kind of gotten through that initial, is it here or not, phase. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I mean, understandably, like if that's what needs to happen for somebody to be able to go into their home country, I mean, I feel like that's a pretty small <laughs> sacrifice to make. But yeah, I mean, based, based, based on what we know about this virus so far, which, you know, is a little bit more than we knew at the start, but still seems like we don't fully understand it. And I certainly don't because I don't know much about viruses, but it seems That's like <laughs> after that much time, <laughs> it would, yeah, after that much time, it seems like it shows its face at least a little bit. So, yeah, 
definitely. So yeah, I, I completely understand the caution that these agencies and governments are putting us through right now, but it, it has been, you know, challenging at times to, you know, again, like convert the whole Royal theater into a testing center or, you know, we're doing all the, like the full social distancing and masks and stuff on the ship now. And it's, it's all just kind of in an effort to get people home at this point. But now that we're leaving Manila, uh, we've actually gotten most of the people that wanted to get off the ship off the ship. In fact, I think everybody that did want to get off has gotten off now. So I'm really not sure where we're headed next. I think we might be headed to Singapore for a resupply mission just to get some more food and bananas and stuff. But <laughs> I'm not sure what's happening after that. We'll see. And so for you, so you had the opportunity to get off in Manila and go back to the States. Uh, I'm assuming based off the way you were talking about that, what was kind of like the process like for you in thinking, uh, you know, option A, stay on the ship, you have kind of, do you have much of an idea of what happens in terms of like when you guys might be able to operate again or option B, go back home? What was that decision like? Um, so, you know, yes, I did have the option to fly home. Actually, they gave me that option twice. I said no both times. Um, just, and because I decided to do that, I, I, a lot of people in my YouTube comments have been like asking me to go more in depth about that decision. And I don't know, I feel like it wasn't a super complicated decision. It's just like, you know, I'm here, I'm safe. I'm in this kind of quarantined bubble, this familiar space that I know, free food, free place to stay. I've got my girlfriend here. I, I mean, I don't know. It didn't seem like a very complicated decision at the time, but um, I guess for some people, it, it it's definitely harder than others. Um, but yeah, as far as going back to service, we, we still really have no idea. You know, even today, the numbers are still so drastically changing and the situation just keeps evolving. So hopefully soon, but who knows? Yeah, for sure. And I, I think, you know, just thinking about like we made the decision to go back to Canada from Panama for a couple of different reasons. And one of the things that we really talked about was, you know, w like the biggest chance of us getting this virus is probably on this trip back home because we had to go through three airports and, you know, we flew mid-March when a lot of people were trying to get back to their home countries. We had to fly through the U.S. and then we flew into one of five international airports in Canada that was accepting Canadians back into the country. And so we encountered, I mean, thousands of other people. And so there was actually, I think that's the only time that we were kind of really stressed about maybe we got this virus was kind of the first week that we got back to Canada because it's like, you know, every dry throat, every sniffle is like, oh my God, is it coronavirus? <laughs> and it's like, we also went through a, yeah, for sure. And we also went through like this massive climate change between, you know, Panama is hot all the time. It's like 90 degrees every day. And we went back to, to Canada and the negatives in Celsius because it's very much still winter where we live in Canada in mid-March. And so, you know, dealing with this weather change, this this stress, it was just like, oh, man. And, you know, knowing what we know now, I feel like it was the the best decision for us. But I definitely like can hear you when you're like, you know, I'm in this environment that feels safe. You know, I've got this place to live. Your partner's there with you. You've got food. You've got everything you need. Like, why put yourself in this situation where you've got to go into a couple international airports and then get back home where it would also be, you know, cold for you, <laughs> assuming you went back to Alaska? That's the exact mentality. And, you know, being on a cruise ship, like, restricted to this, like, small environment, that has definitely been a challenge. And I can see how for a lot of other people, that's just something they wouldn't want to tolerate much longer. But, you know, it, it's more of a mental battle than anything else for me, just kind of overcoming that initial claustrophobia of not being able to leave this ship. But, you know, once, once I kind of overcame that and accepted my circumstances, it, it just made so much sense for every other reason I could think of. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so one of the things I'm curious about is, you know, what does life look like day to day on the cruise ship over the last 116 days in quarantine? While you know, the cruise, the, the, the ship is like moving around a little bit, you know, people are leaving, probably some of your friends have left, gone home, you know, there's like all this uncertainty happening in the world. And, you know, you're just chilling on this cruise ship. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's been, it's been, I look back really fondly on the, the times when everybody was still getting paid because it was great. You know, it, we're on a cruise ship. It's built to entertain. It's built to have this incredible food and incredible experiences with like pools and hot tubs. And, you know, we've got multiple bars and all sorts of stuff. So it was, it was like, a real vacation when we were all still getting paid and everything was happening. Like um, we've got like multiple, like really nice dining restaurants around the ship. We've got a sushi place, an Italian place, a steak place. So, you know, they put those restaurants on this rotation where one would open up every single night and we could go there and eat incredible food for a really low price. And, you know, the, they opened one of the really nice lounges and you could get drinks and dance and all sorts of stuff. Um, this was back before we had to do any of the social distancing and stuff. So we really just had this perfect little cutoff bubble. That was, it felt like we were totally unaffected aside from the fact that we weren't working. Um, but yeah, obviously since, since we got not, paid since they cut our contracts things changed quite a bit um let's see we also had to go on to a like a real quarantine because somebody did get a fever and um we're doing temperature checks for the entire crew right now twice a day and somebody actually did end up getting a fever uh i want to say it was like a month or two ago and the entire ship went into a 14 day lockdown. Uh, and we had to stay like confined to our, our guest stateroom for 14 days, um, me and my girlfriend. So that was something else, like a, another challenge entirely. <laughs> yeah, what was that like 14 days in essentially like a small hotel room basically, right? In terms of size or even smaller? Yeah, no, it's it's a it's about like that, you know. Um, on the bright side, we have a balcony, so you know we could go outside and you know get fresh air and sunlight and stuff. But um, it, it was it was it was something, you know. They would bring you room service, three meals a day. Um, there was a lot of Netflix and Disney Plus, and you know, just general recreational activities involved. Um, I've got this like little VR headset that we use for exercise a lot of the time, but you know, it's, it's mostly just coming up with creative ways to fill time. And that, that real, like just filling time and finding an outlet is the main reason I started making my videos just to give myself a creative outlet and a way to, express all the emotions and stuff that I've been going through. And, you know, my YouTube videos have been a great way to just be creative and stay productive, but also kind of process a lot of this stuff that's been going, that we've been going through emotionally. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think having that outlet is, is so important. And I mean, having to have gone through Canada has a 14 day mandatory travel quarantine when you return home. So that was part of yeah. our decision was knowing that when we came back to Canada, we wouldn't be allowed to leave the house essentially for, for 14 days. And, you know, there's benefits of that. Somebody grocery shop for us, and, you know, did all oh, those, yeah. those chores. But then there's also, you know, the aspect of, I think one weekend I was like, Oh, I really just want to go through like Starbucks drive through and oh we were staying with my parents at that point. And my mom is Don't like, there's... Don't even talk to me about Starbucks. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll send you some. <laughs> but it's oh, just this, this very like, and you've been living this for so long now, but it was just this very like, kind of like first world 
realization where I was like, I just really want like an Americano Mista right now. My dad's like, we yeah. have a coffee machine. And I was like, it's just not the same. Like I want somebody else to make it. He's like, I can right, make you yeah. coffee. I was like, not you. The- like I want like a paid barista to make me a fancy coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I totally get that. And like the big thing for me, me has been like as stupid as it sounds, I just want like McDonald's, like a, like a double cheeseburger from McDonald's and a side of fries. Like, I mean, like it's those, those little creature comforts that I just can't get on the ship that I would normally be able to just quickly get like this familiar taste and sensation that just knowing that I can't have that. And I probably won't have that for a while longer. That's, that's been difficult coping with that. But that being said, the food here is so great. I'm really happy with the situation here but you know it's just those little things that I I can't have yeah yeah I think it's a I mean it's a very obviously this is a very challenging experience in a lot of ways and there's a lot of terrible stuff that's going on to a lot of people with losing jobs and stuff like that and um, but I think it is really interesting to kind of see these these things like wanting Starbucks or wanting McDonald's like we really have access to pretty much anything that we want you know in the western world pretty much like anytime we want it and I think that this has been like a very eye-opening eye-opening experience for a lot of people but I think specifically people kind of in our age range where we've very much grown up with this it's like Never before has it been like, well, not never. I mean, I've been to countries without Starbucks and I've traveled without access to Starbucks and stuff like that. But normally it's like, oh, I want to go get a coffee. It's like, I just walk out the door and I go to the local cafe and I get my fancy coffee. I mean, that's like the world I live in. That's the privilege I have. And, and getting that taken away can feel hard, even though it's like, you know, it's not a big deal on the big scheme of things, but it is this reminder of like how our world has changed a little bit with this virus. Yeah, it's true. And I think a lot of that, um, because yeah, like we travel to places that are less fortunate than, you know, the Western world a lot of the time, but you know, that's always by choice. And it, it really kind of makes you think about like, you know, we're having this situation kind of forced onto us by external circumstances that nobody can really control. And I think that's the big difference. And that's why a lot of people are reacting in different ways and coping with it in different ways. Because when you get that control taken away from you, when you get that choice, it, it, there's no telling how people react. And that, that's something that is really difficult for some people. Yeah, definitely. And so... What does like an average day from kind of waking up to going to bed look like when you're, you know, kind of, I I don't know what the best way to describe it. It's like, you're kind of like unemployed on a cruise ship. You're kind of like on vacation. What does it look like? It's well, you know, it's, it's been really weird to be unemployed in your own workplace and not able to go home, (laughs) but you know, there's usually that stark line between like, I'm on the ship, I'm working I'm at home, I'm not working. And you know, that's the kind of the, separation of life that we have but you know it's been weird and you know just I mean it's 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 nothing glamorous or exciting you know it's just um it's you know we 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 exercise we eat food we watch tv and make videos like I mean I I don't know how else to put it exactly you know there's there's not much going on and i guess to a lot of people it sounds boring but you know it, it's it's really nice i think to have life distilled so much down to these like simple components in a way and it's given me a lot of time to think and reflect about life and just kind of hit the pause button and take stock of what's important to me mm-hmm Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that that's, you know, maybe a silver lining for a lot of us with this. And I think that, you know, Ryan and I have both certainly experienced that to some level. We both work online. So we've just been continuing to work and and that sort of thing. And obviously lucky to be able to do that. But it has been interesting noticing like the time that we have since we're not traveling. And I mean, we're not really doing a lot of social stuff at this point, other than some like, you know, Zoom friend catch ups and playing house party with friends and that sort of thing. And 
yeah, I feel like I've definitely learned a lot about, you know, not only myself, but also the things that I like to spend my time doing, which I think is, dare I say, like a gift to some of us. And, and I'm sure there's people out there that are like, there's nothing about this that is a gift. It's horrible. And I do recognize that there is a lot of horrible stuff that's happening. But I think, you know, if you are lucky enough to be in a position where you have a house and you have food and you maybe have a job that you're still doing, I think it is nice to kind of sit back and recognize what life's like without all the busyness and the the chaos and, you know, the social events like, my average summer, it's like I'm booking out social events like four weeks in advance on the weekends. And it's been nice to just be like, uh, there's, I don't know what I'm doing next week. I don't know what I'm doing next weekend. You know, we don't have any plans. I totally agree. And, you know, it's, it's been really interesting, you know, especially now that most of our friends have gone home from the ship. It's basically just down to the two of us. And, you know, it's, it's different. And you spend a lot more time with yourself just reflecting on things. And I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It almost sounds like, like describing like the end of like survivor or something like, Oh, we're just here waiting it out. Um, but it is something I think that one of the things that, as I hear you talking about that, that we really love about sometimes longer trips, um, and going on like bigger backpacking adventures is that like we so rarely in life get the opportunity to be like truly bored. Um, we're like, we, you know, from the time you, you grow up, you're on this treadmill, right. Of like, everything's happening and everything's happening for like the next thing. Like you're going through elementary, so you can get to high school, you go through high school for college, college, work, work, promotion, et cetera, et cetera. And just waking up with that feeling of like, Hey, what do I want to do today? Um, day after day after day, you learn so much about yourself in terms of what makes you happy. So I think it is something that, that is really, um, it really an experience that like people get a lot of value out of and can, you know, I dare say like should try to find opportunities in life where they can be like really bored for a period of time. Oh, I, I totally agree. And, you know, with, with, you know, on the subject of backpacking and being off the grid and stuff like I totally agree. And it feels like we're almost conditioned nowadays in our society to fight that feeling of boredom and fight that feeling of not really doing anything because I don't know, it's like people are scared of it, but I think there's something really powerful to be said about just sitting and being alone with your thoughts. Um, And, you know, a lot of people do that in the shower nowadays because you know, you, you can't really take your electronic devices in there. But um, yeah, it feels like nowadays with the dawn of the internet and social media and technology that every waking minute is supposed to be filled with something, some sensory experience. But um, I think it's so important to, you know, take those moments when you can and just cut yourself off from it. Yeah, very well said. And so one thing I wanted to to ask about, you mentioned kind of how YouTube videos have become a creative outlet, how it's been something that you really fill your day with. And I really love that idea of like, you know, finding a creative project, not like asking, like, you could be like, hey, I have nothing to do. I'm just going to like, you know, waste away. But you're like, hey, I want to do something. I want to create something. And so I'm looking through your YouTube channel. And I know you you were making some videos like a year ago. And one thing that kind of stands out is the numbers, right? Like I'm sure these have grown even the old videos. But you see ramen in Japan, 2,000 views, um, 2,000 views, something that has 3,600 views, something that has 13,000 views when you start on your cruise ship. And two videos later, 300,000 views. Um, What was that like? So kind of walk us through when you started putting out the videos on YouTube and then what was that like to have like, you know, all of a sudden like, wham, hundreds of thousands of people are watching my adventures on a cruise ship. (laughs) I'm not going to lie. You know, there's, there's an element of it that really like, you know, there's all these new people just like watching me from across the internet. And that definitely gives you a sense of anxiety to a certain extent. Like I've, I've gotten it over it now, but because it happened so quickly and I don't think I was fully prepared for that. um, There was definitely a time when I was like, Oh my gosh, this is, I, I I started overthinking everything about my creative process. And like, I, I didn't want to, I I don't even know, like not like do something wrong or I don't know. I kind of lost my voice for a little bit there, but I think I'm 
kind of recovering that now. But, you know, when I first made the videos, I think the most viewed video I had for more than a year was like 159 views or something like that. And that was my very first video that I made um, where I flew from Alaska to Shanghai to sign on to the cruise ship. And, you know, I was, it was, it was, it was fun because it felt like it was just like this little thing that I was making for me and some of my friends and maybe a couple of people that I didn't know, but it was very, very small and it was, it was fun. And then, you know, there's always that, that part of me that was like, this would be super cool if more people started watching this. But then it just exploded in like a month. I got over 10,000 subscribers and all these views just started pouring in from like left and right. And it was crazy. And it was just, you know, I, it's like, well, it's something I, I can't really control that. You know, if people like my content and they like it and I'm happy, but yeah, at the same time, it's been like a little bit of stage fright at the same time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I've never had 300,000 people view a video of mine, but I can imagine that that would be like, oh, God. And then it's also kind of interesting that it's like, you know, going from creating more, I guess you could say like traditional travel content to like, hey, guys, I'm stuck on a cruise ship in Asia. And all of a sudden people are like, well, that's interesting. Let me tune in for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people are, you know, nobody's allowed to go on cruise ships right now. And I feel like that's the big draw is people are starved for that cruise ship experience and that lifestyle. And because I'm pretty much one of the only people left that's making content like this, I, I think I just got really lucky, right place at the right time. And I, I guess like, I hope my videos are actually like, I you know, there's a difference between being the only person in a room that that's talking about this or versus like, you know, it's, it's kind of given me this existential crisis about like, when not, when all this starts again, am I just going to like fade back into non-existence or I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, Oh, I'm not stuck on a cruise ship anymore. People don't really care what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, sorry. Um, what do I do now? But you know, one day at a time. Yeah. You'll have to like, you know, consciously create that brand as like the guy stuck on things and you'll have to figure out something else to get stuck on. Oh, there we go. Stuck on a canoe in the wilderness, guys, but seriously, send help. There's bears. I've been stuck on a cross-country semi-truck. Yeah. But yeah, I think you're right though. I think that, you know, I mean, even for us, like I was talking to one of my best friends who lives in, you know, central Alberta. And if you're not familiar with that area, it's, there's not much going on there. And I was like, can we come out for a socially distanced vi uh, visit? And she's like, you must be like really starved for adventure. If that's your idea of a good time right now. And I was like, anything that gets me like out of the house feels like a good time at this point because we've been stuck inside for so long. So I mean, I get it. You're in this very unique experience. You know, you're doing this thing that probably, 90 some odd percent of the world will never get to experience and I think like people at home are like I mean you could watch like Netflix or Disney plus and kind of escape from the reality or you could watch your videos and like hear from somebody who's having this like crazy unique quarantine experience which I understand the draw to it for sure yeah yeah it's um it, there's there's something to be said about what I'm going through right now and you know these cruise ships aren't designed to be empty for this long you know um we're constantly having guests on board you know we you know the whole workflow and logistics process is designed to get old guests off and new guests on within the same day and start another voyage so we in terms of making revenue the idea is as little downtime as possible so you can imagine something like right now having the entire fleet just empty is just insane <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely it's a it's it's crazy i mean looking at photos and videos of airports and you know docked areas it's like all these vessels that we use for exploring the world and traveling are just 
grounded right now. And it's definitely pretty interesting. I'm, I'm curious if you have like any thoughts on kind of what the future of cruises look like. Like, do you imagine that people will be back on cruises once they can be and things will kind of run business as normal? Do you think people will avoid cruises? Do you have any sense for that? I, I think it really depends on what what these different companies end up doing differently to ensure people's safety on board and ensure that we don't get another repeat of the Diamond Princess. Um, I think their ability to actually create a safe environment on board and also to reassure people of the fact that there is a safe environment on board is going to be critical to whether or not people are actually willing to come back onto these ships anytime soon. Um, what they're going to do in order to make that happen, I have no idea. I'm going to leave that to the smarter people. <laughs> but um, I, I certainly hope that we come up with some cool, innovative ways to keep people safe and provide a really fun and entertaining travel experience at the same time. But I have no idea what that's going to look like. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, I imagine, I feel like if I had to bet on it, I'd bet it. I think people love, uh, people who like going on cruises, like love going on cruises. And I probably like a good spur for some better innovation when it comes to, you know, air filtration, all that type of stuff. But I, I, I'm optimistic about it. But one thing, one final question, and then we'll let you go. Um, have you heard from anyone at, you said, I believe you said it was Royal Caribbean. Have you heard of anyone at Royal Caribbean? Have they like reached out to you and been like, Hey, like, awesome videos or like, Hey, don't talk about this thing or anything. Like that. <laughs> um, nobody's tried to shut me down so far, which has been great. I've so far, at least on board, I've gotten a really positive response from some of the managers and the captain and the executive team. Um, they seem to really like what I'm doing and the positive lens that I'm trying to present the situation through. Um, in terms of Shoresight, I know that some people, I, I know that somebody talked to the captain and said that they really like my videos. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm sure that other people have seen and seen stuff, but uh, I've had a lot of fellow employees, like light technicians and other like technicians and stuff in the entertainment department on cruise ships reach out to me and say hi, but you know, so far I haven't really gained the ear of anybody super high up in Royal Caribbean yet, but you know, fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully anything that comes down is, is positive. I mean, it seems like it's good press for them at this point. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I, I don't, I don't see them asking me to stop at any time soon or at all. I think they're, they're pretty happy with what I've been doing and I'm trying to be as sensitive as I can to all parties involved while still trying to present the facts in an informative way. So that's kind of a fine line to walk right now with, you know, how, how quickly things can go bad as far as press is concerned. But I think I've been doing a pretty good job so far. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. We've been enjoying your videos and I'm excited to continue tuning in to see what's, what's up with your world of your world on the cruise ship. And with, with that note, yeah, with that note, can you tell listeners where they can go to find you, how they can find your videos and all that good stuff, Riley? Of course. So yeah, I've got the YouTube channel. It's just youtube.com slash Riley Tinch, or you can just search for me on Google, um, Riley Tinch. And yeah, I've got social media all over the place. But yeah, just find me on YouTube and check it out. Hopefully you like my videos. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, we will make sure there's links for all of that in the show notes. And thank you so much for chatting with us from the middle of <laughs> from the middle of Asia on a cruise ship and for staying up late to chat with us. It's been awesome. To find more information, relevant links, and photos talked about in this week's episode, check out theworldwanderers.com. If you have a question, comment, or feedback, send us an email at info at theworldwanderers.com. Join our community on Facebook at The World Wanders or on Twitter at World Wanders One. As always, thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. Bye. <laughs>